Okay, thank you, Justin McKenzie, and welcome everyone to our Tech and Learning webinar. Today, we're gonna to be talking about standards-based learning and grading, and specifically about how to develop a game plan as you plan for the coming school year. And a special thanks to our sponsor, Otis, for making our conversation today possible. So most of you know the movement towards standard-based learning has been in motion for over 30 years, um, and yet there's still some confusion about it, and so why this model is valuable, et cetera. So today we brought together some experts to share their advice about how you can tackle some of the most pressing questions about standards-based learning and grading, and also how you can prepare to address questions in the new school year. But before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to meet all of you. So if you could put your chat into the chat using the Q&A below, put your name and your school district and where you're joining us from. We are thrilled that you can be with us today. And I also wanna remind you that we love interaction. So please throughout the conversation, use that Q&A to ask some questions as we move along. And we will be addressing them at the end of our conversation and we will get to as many as we can. And then our friends at Otis are in the background as well to help address some, if you have a specific question, they can answer that as well. So I'm sure there'll be quite a few on this topic. Um, but first I want to, now we're ready to meet our panelists. So first we have Eddie Oakley. He is a learning acceleration specialist at the Ohio Valley Education Cooperative, and he has worked as a principal and a chief operations officer and a transportation coordinator, and he missed the academic world, so that's what brought him to his role today. We also have Jay Meadows, chief executive officer at Exemplars, and that's uh, where he uses his performance tasks to develop and assess student abilities um, in math and beyond. We also have Barb Geibel, who joins us from Salem School District in a new role, which I find very interesting um, as a mentor lead. So she's actually gonna be supporting new educators to the district. So love that your district has made that available. That's great. And then last but certainly not least, we have uh, Kelly Ronneback, who is the Associate Superintendent for Student Achievement at East Moline School District 37 where she has spent most of her career in education. So we have got a lot of expertise in the house with us today. So let's get started. Um, all right, I wanted to dig in on kind of some of the, you know, the how-tos for standards-based learning. And I thought maybe we could talk first about the core principles that guide your school's gui uh, grading practices, you know, how you implement them and how you provide meaningful feedback for that. Um, so Kelly, if it's okay, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, that'd be great. Thank you, first of all, for having me today. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, my district began utilizing um, instructional strategies that focused on um, teaching to state standards and not necessarily to specific a specific textbook or what have you. And as we were making this shift, um, we were creating proficiency scales, essential standards, common assessments, and we just really noticed there was a big disconnect between how we were teaching and how we were grading and reporting to parents. And so our instructional strategies and what we were doing in the classroom just really wasn't, um, wasn't aligned to what we were reporting. So that led us to investigate standards-based grading. And we just found that um, standards-based uh, standards grading system really focuses on student learning of the course content, not as much on, um, you know, engagement or like how willing a child is to or their effort or what have you. And so we, we really liked that we were able to show parents exactly um, where their students were performing as in relation to a standard rather than their effort. And um, our system really aligns more closely with what we're doing in the classroom with our instructional practices and creates a more specific and accurate and more understandable description of what students are doing for not only the parents, but also for children. Um, we utilize scales in our classroom so children know exactly what they have to do in order to um, you know, meet or exceed. And so I think it just really um, gives clarity um, for everyone involved. Um, and then we're more at, and able to um, communicate that with our um, parents as well. And the parents are so important in this role, in this conversation. So I, I love that you have that open line of communication with them. Um, so uh, how about Barb? Let's hear what you're, how you're um, addressing this new district. Hi, um, 
Well, kind of like Kelly was saying, a lot of it has to go back to our report card that we um, have been using did not align to what we were actually measuring. So then when it would come time for conferences, um, telling the parents what we were seeing and sharing wasn't reflecting on necessarily on the grade on the report card. So we are in the very uh, beginning stages. Last year is when we started to meet as grade levels and go through all of our standards, pick out our essential standards, find the ones that we um, felt were the most important, um, and then started aligning our assessments and um, building a report card from that. And um, we're looking forward to it, very excited, because like you were saying, it didn't match what we were teaching and what we were looking for for their growth. And it will 100% help with the parents and answer a lot of questions up front, just showing right out what their child has mastered, what their child is still struggling at, instead of this obscure report card that they were getting before. Excellent. Thank you. Again, parents in clear line of communication. Um, Jay, you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing in your district? So one of my guiding principles is that there's a lot of problems in the 21st century that our students are going to be re responsible for solving. And seeing the world through the lens of a math teacher, I started realizing that the grading practices we had in our classroom wasn't really asking our kids to think about those problems and develop those 21st century skills. Getting right or wrong answers on algorithms is, is important in math, always will be, but it's only a fraction of what mathematics is. That's, that's really the arithmetic piece. Mathematics is this gigantic, valuable skill that students need practice uh, learning, but, but in a way that's more about application about communicating mathematically, about seeing mathematics visually with representations and, and diagrams. But the traditional report card wasn't really doing that. I was giving kids A's and B's. I was giving 90% on tests on procedural fluency, which for me now in the 21st century, my phone can do that, right? I, my, I have a calculator in my pocket that's more powerful than anything that I'll ever be able to do. So what should we be asking our kids then to do in the math classroom? And I, as I started doing research, I, I discovered the NCTM process standards that were developed in the 90s. And they talk about things like problem solving, communication, reasoning and proof, representations and making connection. And I started asking my kids to, to think about these skills. And I started thinking about how do I do that with my students? And when I started asking questions that expected those from my students, suddenly the engagement level went up in my, in my classroom. I, my kids could, when I would do problem solving, they were like, I can solve this any way I want, Mr. Mouse. Like, absolutely, apply your math skills. So when we think about math a little bit bigger than just procedures and algorithms, suddenly the expectations are more, more aligned to the 21st century needs. So that's, that's kind of where my head's been a lot lately. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, Eddie, let's hear from you, please. Yeah, kind of like the, the others. Uh, our, our pathway was a little bit different. Um, in 2014, I had a parent come in my office, asked me why his son couldn't score higher than a 19 on the ACT, but yet he had a 4.3 GPA in my building. After looking at it, it's, he was there every day. He got extra credit. He did everything that the teachers asked him to do. But when he took a summative assessment, he didn't score very well. So that got me into to looking at standards based grading and taking that year to feed my staff and get them ready uh, to move to it. So mastering other standards and, and focusing on standards, those priority standards, staying away from the efforts and the extra credits and all those things so we really know where kids are and what, what, what they can and can't do. Excellent, thank you. So um, <clears throat> for my next question, I, it might be helpful for our audience also if you could talk a little bit about your district. So district size, maybe some general uh, kind of facts about your district so our audience knows uh, a little bit more about you and, and your students and your community. Um, but I was curious what steps you took to align and this is always, you know, getting out of the silo, right? Aligning the curriculum and the instruction and the assessment 
just to ensure that consistency across grade levels and across subjects. So Bard, maybe we'll start with you and maybe Again, if you could share maybe a little bit about your district and then uh, talk a little bit about how you aligned um, these pieces. Sure. Um, we are a small community. However, um, we have the largest K-8 in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we have four or five of every grade and we're 4K through eighth grade. So we have, um, you know, like I said, four or five of grade levels. So we have a strong, you know, team within our grade levels to work with. Um, we do, you know, vertical as well. Um, our population is diverse. We have, you know, from lower to upper. So we have a lot of, a lot of dynamics coming in. Um, when we started looking at all of this, kind of like I had said earlier, it was um, within our grade level. It was not dictated by administration on what standards to choose. It was through the state, what standards, what ones were the most essential that we were using within our grade level. Um, and then we um, just worked together and made sure that our assessments were aligning to meet those standards. Um, we also use Otis to help us with putting all of those in and making the accountability and the consistency so that we're all on the same page so that parents who, you know, cause we have twins sometimes as an example, if you have one of them in one room in four, first grade and another in another room in first grade, um, they're getting assessed on the same sorts of things. Their standards are the same. It's not coming home. There's no gray. It's very black and white on what your child knows or doesn't know, did not, depending on what classroom that they're in, so. And so when you're um, talking about across grade levels and subject levels, um, can you talk a little bit about how you got the buy-in from everybody in, in your district? Uh, was everybody kind of on board with it or is it using Otis because you have a standard platform? Just, just a kind of follow-up question there. I think in the beginning, of course, you know, you have some who are, um, leery on it did something different right but also at the same time i know that our report cards k through two we were using um n s m for you know not sufficient or satisfactory um e for exemplary um and there's a wide range in there so we were getting very frustrated when then dealing not dealing but talking with parents about where their child was within that s it was very hard for them to understand, well, why isn't that a this or a that? So yeah. at this point, it wasn't that difficult for most people to get on board and be ready for something different. We've actually been wanting something different for quite a few years. So there was more excitement within our building um, to finally be able to move forward and get this going. Excellent. Thank you so much. And then uh, let's see, uh, we have, I'm going to call on Kelly next, if that's okay. Okay. And did you want me to tell a little bit about my district as well? I would love that. Yeah. Just let's get to know you a little bit. Let's get to know your yeah. district and your and your student body and community. Perfect. Yeah. So I um, my district is a pre-K through eighth grade district um, in uh, Illinois. We're about three hours west of Chicago on the Iowa Illinois border. Um, we have one early childhood building, four elementary buildings that have K, um, kindergarten through fourth grade, and then one fairly large middle school that has grades five through eight in it. Um, we are um, a very diverse uh, district. We have over 42 language, languages spoken by our students, and we offer five bilingual programs, um, five different languages and with bilingual programs in the district. We have uh, Spanish, uh, Arabic, Eve, French, and Chin. And so um, very diverse. Uh, we also are um, have a very high percentage of low um, income. So, um, so we, but we're very proud of our diversity. And um, I think that the standards-based grading really helps with um, us being able to give true pictures to parents and teachers and to students um, since we do have such a diverse population. 
Um, but yeah, moving when we moved from traditional grading to standards based grading, it was a big shift. But I think our teachers were really excited about it because they did feel that disconnect between what we were doing with instruction and then having to mesh that into a letter grade was um, very difficult for them. And so actually um, groups of teachers were coming to us at the district level um, wanting to visit that. So we developed a very large um, committee to start with and we started with learning as a group, just like doing different book studies. Um, what are the possibilities with standards based grading? What is it? Um, and then um, from there, at the same time, we were having um, our different curriculum committees work on essential standards. And whenever we have a committee, we always make sure we have um, representation from diff from all the different buildings, different grade levels and whatnot, so that we're hearing all the voices um, in the district. So um, that also helps with buy-in just to know that, um, you know, things weren't just decided by a group of um, administrators or, you know, a kindergarten teacher can buy into it if she knows there's a couple kindergarten teachers on those committees making those decisions. So, um, so we were doing that, um, getting our essential standards or priority standards in line. We were making proficiency scales so that we could really um, outline for students and teachers and parents, what does it mean when you meet a standard, what's all involved in that. Um, and then we use Otis, um, when we first started, we just used Otis to create our assessments. Um, we didn't use it as a grade book. We were still doing traditional grades, but we used Otis because it enabled us to have standards um, a lot, you know, attached to questions and assessments and still use our traditional grading system. So that really helped us in when we were trying to transition between the two. Um, so that was really helpful. And, um, and then for like, um, once we had kind of that district level um, continuity established so that we had um, the similar essential standards across the district, we had similar end of unit assessments that would bring continuity across the district. Then we also have PLCs within buildings and those um, PLCs work on um, individual like PLC assessments and instruction and whatnot so that there is that autonomy um, and they can meet the needs of their individual classrooms. And then at the same time, we have um, the district wide um, resources that are used as well, just to kind of um, make sure that's guaranteed and viable across the district. So that's kind of our, our um, those are the steps we took in a very quick nutshell. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so, Eddie, I'd love to hear from you and uh, about this question about rolling this out, especially if you've worn a lot of hats in your career, as probably many of us on the call here. But um, you can tell us a little bit uh, about, again, about your district, about maybe how you rolled this out and um, and how you get it kind of across um, grades and, and um, curricula and that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. We. Um... We're a district that borders Jefferson County, which is Louisville here in Kentucky. So we sit next to Louisville. Uh, it's a rural community on the I-64 corridor. Lexington's to our to our east, Louisville to our west. So uh, we have probably the, well, we do. Uh, Shelby County has the highest percentage of Hispanic students in the state with about uh, almost 20% of our student population uh, in our school buildings. So back when uh, when I started this standard space uh, down that road, we uh, got our teachers involved. Then when we went to uh, uh, figuring out our assessments and what we were going to do with assessments, uh, we kind of started with the end in mind uh, that we'd build our summative assessments first and then uh, build, build to those. Um, towards the standards. Um, a lot of it uh, was a vertical alignment from, from kindergarten to 12th grade. We, uh, we built those. Uh, now the school district here in Shelby County has a profile of a graduate. So it tells every parent what a student should be able to do by the end of that grade level going into the next grade level. Um, so that took time. Um, took a lot of uh, energy and uh, work from the teachers across the district. Uh, kind of like the other panelists, we uh, I fed them a lot of articles. I fed a lot of uh, uh, 
every Sunday night, I wrote a rocket report. And in that rocket report was stuff about standard space. So um, we started at the high, high school first in this district. And then it went backwards. Everybody else got on board. So I started it. Everybody else got on board. And now the whole district is a uh, uh, standard space district. That's fantastic. So you, you built the portrait of a graduate. I, I, could you elaborate a little bit on, on what that is and who was in, involved? And obviously standardizing everything yeah. seems key to that, right? Yeah, that was, um, that was a big committee that had teachers, classified personnel, parents, community members. And if you, I'll give you guys the website, you can go on there and, and read about the, um, the profile. But the profile we looked at is there's six, um, six pieces to it. Global citizen, effective communicator, long, uh, lifelong learners, inspired innovators, critical thinkers and responsible collaborators and mm. it's in a wheel and there's a our, our district this district now uh our students at the fifth the eighth and the twelfth grade have to do a defenses of learning every student that goes to that next transition has to do a defense of learning to see that they're ready to go to the next uh grade level whether it be six to our fifth to six eighth to ninth or 12th to real life in college. I love that. Just having a real clear framework and everybody on the same page there, that's that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then, uh, so Jay, let's hear from you. Um, so tell us a little bit about exemplars. I don't think we uh, got the details about that. And then you can talk a little bit about, you know, rolling out standards across different grades and curricula. Awesome. So my role with exemplars, um, we work with schools in 50 states and actually 32 countries. Um, and we've been working for about 30 years on this question of standards based learning. Um, the founder of exemplars, Dr. Ross Brewer, was good friends with Jay McTie and Grant Wiggins and was this, the, my favorite story is he, he was in a cabin with the three of them sort of dreaming up how do we assess our students ability to use math in the real world. And they came up with this idea of what if we could use performance assessments to do that? Um, so that's kind of the, the origin story. And, and we're very lucky to work with, with schools and districts across the country. Um, I love what Eddie said about starting with the assessments, because I think what that helps do is it sets the foundation of what the expectations are going to be for your students, but also for your teachers. Right. When the unit assessments have bigger questions than procedural fluency. And again, I'm still thinking about math. But but there's these questions of what does a representation with that particular math concept look like? Can my students use it? What's the language and vocabulary around that topic that my students can 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 they use it? Do they understand what it means? But can they actually use it? Of course, the calculations are important, but also this idea of application. Does my student recognize in a real world setting like, oh, this is that moment for, let's say, procedural fluency or dividing with fractions. Like, do they recognize that real world moment and recognize how to use that skill? So when you when you start with your assessments, you can kind of work backwards, right? You can sort of say, OK, if these are the expectations, the big ideas, how are we going to do that in my classroom? And then that drives a lot of conversations in your PLCs and in your professional development with your teachers like, all right, we've got to work on representations. What's that going to look like? Let's break that down for third grade, for fifth grade, for eighth grade. So you, you can drive a lot of really important conversations with teachers around that. What I find really interesting when you do that and you ask kids to start thinking about math beyond just procedural fluency, it actually increases the engagement levels of your students. When students are sort of given the freedom to sort of say, here's a here's a cool problem. Here's it's going to be kind of challenging, but you can solve this any way you want. Students actually have I've been in classrooms. And the kid goes, I can really solve this any way I want to. And the teacher's like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, just you, you get the right answer. And then you kind of show me how you got it. Like, oh, OK. You watch the engagement level just spike in the classroom because suddenly there's a freedom in the math classroom that's a little bit different because a lot of times math is kind of linear. We, you're supposed to do A, B and C. So. 
when you establish those expectations, one of the things that I find is if you can have a consistent set of expectations from kindergarten through high school in mathematics, where you have sort of big ideas that you're going to work on year after year after year, what my research shows is it takes about three years for the kids and the teachers to kind of wrap themselves into these expectations to sort of see the, 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 uh, the zenith of the growth. But it takes a while for everybody to sort of wrap their heads around these things. But over time, because the expectations are the same year after year, everybody's sort of bought in. Everybody sort of sees math in the same way. And, and so kids move up to the next grade level and they're like, oh, yeah, OK, we're going to do this rich problem solving again. OK, I'm going to have to show my thinking with representations and language. So consistency, I think, is a key to standards based learning. And as Eddie was talking about, it takes time. It, you, you need to spend time with your teachers and your and your communities to sort of think. About this stuff. So, um, it's it's a but it's a powerful journey. And I, and I, what I love is that we see test scores, end of the year test scores grow dramatically when we ask kids to go beyond just procedural fluency in the math classroom. They, they can solve any problem you put in front of them. So these higher expectations lead to higher results, but it does, it takes time. So would you say that it's that student agency that's driving those higher scores ultimately because of the increased engagement? I love that, that idea of student agency. Quite often in a math classroom, a teacher will be will recognize there's a procedure that I need my kids to learn at the end of the unit. And so they get to that procedure really quickly in the math classroom. And they're like, okay, I'm gonna teach you the procedure and we're gonna practice it. What I see in a standards-based classroom is like, well, the journey of understanding that procedure is just as important as being able to run the procedure itself. So if a teacher's recognizing representations are important, you can start with hands-on manipulatives in the unit. You can explore the concept, you can make sense of it. And sense making is a huge part of mathematics. So give your students the time to kind of make sense of things, develop their own strategies, share strategies. And when you allow kids to share different strategies for solving the same problem, suddenly math becomes a lot more interesting to them and a lot more powerful to them because they see that magic, the magic of mathematics, which I don't think a lot of students ex experience, like, wait, I can solve the same problem seven different ways? Well, that's kind of cool. And what they begin to realize is that any problem you put in front of them probably can be solved a variety of ways. So um, that agency, that ability to think of math as an exploration and to play with mathematics um, transforms the math classroom from this very static uh, you must do it exactly this way to, okay, try and search for the right answer. Let's see. You prove to me how you got there. Um, right. Kids love it. And, I, and yeah. I believe that's a great way to prepare for the real world, right? 100%. See, I'm just solving that one problem. So uh, thank you very much for that. So we were can talking I, um, about... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I jump in there real quick? Please, please I, do. Um, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that because I also agree that, um, to begin with the end in mind, and that's one of i'm just going to put in a little plug for using goals and scales because when we we kind of did the same thing only we started with the standard and really made sure that teachers understood what the standard was asking of students because what we found mm -hmm. was a lot of our assessments really weren't getting to what stand the standard was really wanting them to do especially at the upper grades um they were um the upper grades were kind of living in this low level um um of thinking, whereas the standard was really written at a higher level, like they wanted them to analyze or, you know, prove something. And um, so that's, it's, I can't stress I mean, any more strongly that that really is essential to make standards based grading really um, successful. So really make sure teachers are really aware of what their standards are actually asking of the students and to make sure their instruction and assessments are, are getting to that too. So just wanted to throw that in as a little. Please, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you did, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if Barb or Eddie, if you wanted to piggyback off of that before we move to the next question. Not that the only good. the only thing that I would say, um, and I agree with everything that that each of those folks said, but um, one of the things that I I strive to do in our building was when we looked at the the assessments, making sure that they were rigorous enough and the instruction was rigorous mm -hmm. enough. 
But what I always told my teachers and my kids was we are going to make the practice harder than the game. Mm -hmm. So when we go and we, the instruction, the, the formative and summatives, we want to make them harder than when you go take the ACD. That, that, wow, I've seen this. I know it. I can do this. So it's kind of our philosophy of making the practice harder than the game. Yeah, I like that. Barbara, you must be a good. coach, Eddie, because that's that's the, one of those great coaching philosophies, right? It's like that practice, yes. that, the game's going to be easy after you finish my practices. So, and, right. and math can be, yeah. and learning can be the, exactly the same way. I uh, I did dabble in some coaching uh, mm -hmm. earlier in my my career. Some mm -hmm. try to be a basketball coach, just like everybody else in Kentucky. <laughs> I love it. So we've been talking a lot about you know parents and communicating. So I, I wanted to maybe dig in a little bit more on that. So specifically, how are you communicating, say, the learning expectations, the grading policies? To, we talked about students. And I think I'm loving hearing that the students are involved in this and that there is this agency and that increases the engagement. I, I have heard a lot of parents just saying, why, you know, just there's so when I was in school, we got we were graded this way. So, you know, how do you kind of communicate that? And, you know, are there tools and strategies? I'd love to dig into any nuts and bolts you can share, even maybe even examples. Um, Eddie, maybe we'll, we'll start with you uh, if that's OK. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we uh, we started our this process by first with the staff getting the staff on board. And then once we got to a point, then we got it out to to families and we used, uh, you know, I wrote I wrote letters home to families and some of the stuff that you've already talked about, about, you know, when I was in school, uh, it was 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, it was a percentage. But my question to those parents was, so tell me what, what that 70 or that 80%, tell me what that meant. And they, they couldn't tell me what it meant. You know, with standards space, I, their students can tell them what it means because they they know when, when they've mastered uh, a standard or so forth. So, you know, again, that's been uh, 10 years ago. Uh, what it looked like when when I got it going and, and, and we got it in our school and across the district since then, I've moved on from that position. So as I go into Shelby County High School now and look at things going on in Shelby County's district, because. I am working with a number of their principals and, and actually the principal of Shelby County High. Um, it looks a lot different uh, how they're communicating those things. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, social media wasn't what it is today. So they're using that a lot um, with different different types of uh, media to get things out to parents and, and students. Um, so that's that's a good thing. And it sounds like the students have been helping in this process, but just by bringing it home and explaining to their parents, this is what this means. This is what I've gotten out of it. I mean, what better yeah. communication tool than your own child? <laughs> right. um, and the big thing is with the, with the kids um, in the last five, four, five, six years, since we uh, developed and come up with the profile of graduate, I mean, one of those skills is, you know, effective communicator and our students in Shelby County, um, they can stand up in front of a crowd and and, and talk to a, a group of uh, panelists like this and, and explain and talk to them about you know, their learning and, and why they're ready to move on to the next level or next grade or on to college or, or career. Excellent, thank you. And and Barb, maybe we can hear from you. I, I, and I know you're new in this role of this, this mentor role, which I'm fascinated uh, uh, with that entails, but, so from your new lens, and I know this is very new, but um, kind of maybe where are you in that process and any sort of tips or strategies that you've been using um, to help communicate this to parents and school communities in general? Well, we are just going to be starting it. So our staff through the summer, some of them had finished like in um, May, had met in May, but then through the summer, our grade levels have come in, um, have finalized, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which standards they're going to be doing the essential standards, putting that all together. Um, our head person is working into the 
um, Otis to be getting it set up for us. So at our in-service, our back-to-school in-service, which is the week of the 26th, our staff, we're starting it on the other end in our building. We're starting with our 4K through second grade, and they will be the ones that will have the standard-based report card implemented right away in the fall. Um, so there will be lots of communication going home to the parents about that. Yes, it'll be different, but at the same time, like how I was saying earlier, ours was an OSN sort of deal for grading, and it left a lot of questions for parents. So I think this will actually be a breath of fresh air for them because it's going to show them exactly what their child knows and what their child doesn't know. Um, the older grades, third through um, eighth grade, will still be using the standard, you know, 90 to 100 scale. However, they will be Im implementing changes this year as far as the effort grade will not be weighed the same. There won't be the extra credit. Um, there, the homework, those sorts of things will be gone per se. Um, so they're gently making that switch. And then by next year is my understanding, the whole entire school will be moved to our standards based. I think it's interesting that you started at the K, uh, K through two, and mm -hmm. then you've got your basically you're building your student ambassador community as you as you move right. to the grades, right? Right. Excellent. And we have um, a curriculum night too. So when the parents come, that's the first week of October. This will be discussed even more, you know, us, gives us the ability to tell them in person of all the things that are going to be happening this year and what to look for when their children bring home work or um, their report cards, anything, conference slips, all of that good stuff. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And then uh, Kelly, let's let's hear from you, please. Yeah, so um, we had a very slow rollout um, to go standards based grading fully. Uh, we started out um, since our K through four buildings, they're self contained classrooms, so teachers teach everything. And so um, we the first year we just had K through four um, doing ELA um, as standards based grading and then they did everything else traditional. And then at the middle school, um, they kind of similar to um, what um, uh, Barb was saying was that th we just kind of did a gentle start. So they used traditional grades, but they started changing some of their practice with like extra credit and being able to for kids to take um, an assessment again and, you know, make changes and things like that. So um, we we worked on um, just kind of mindset at the middle school um, the first year. But while we were doing that soft start or slow start, we were at the same time holding town hall type meetings for parents, both in person and virtually. Um, we were sending home um, different flyers, um, both paper and um, through social media. And um, and then we also at parent teacher conferences and at different um, events, we had a short video that just kind of scrolled through over and over again, um, just, just kind of gave um, the highlights of standards based grading. So it's pretty much like um, we just were communicating whenever we could, we found a way to get that message out there. Um, but that's how we started. And then the next year we did um, elementary, did uh, ELA and math. And then the middle school, um, they had a, a principal change, so they wanted to just do part of the building with standards based. So they did five, six, fifth grade and sixth grade as standards based. Seventh and eighth grade had a few more things to work out for like eligibility and things like that for sports. So um, they did traditional grades another year, but this is our first year that we're gonna be 100%. Um, every subject, every grade level will be standards based grading. Um, moving forward. So, um, you know, really a lot of the, the communication, though, even though we did a lot of those um, town hall meetings and we did flyers, it really happens through conversations, um, both with the students going home and explaining things to um, their parents, but also because we're using standards based grading and that's how we're instructing when we have conferences, what we're saying about our instruction flows really easily into the standard based grading. And so I really think that having those conversations with parents, with their teachers is really um, was really the game changer as far as getting parents to truly understand, um, you know, how that worked. So 
I think it's interesting that you, it's almost like you provided PD for everybody by doing kind of a gradual rollout. So some, most students had a little taste of it in their journey. A lot of teachers probably get, and then parents too. So right. when you do the full rollout this year, hopefully some of them have had some experience with this along the way. Sounds like right. not as scary. It's not as scary. Exactly. Because <laughs> change is scary, right? <laughs> uh, change is, yeah, change is good. Yeah. Change can be scary. Absolutely. This, uh, so I really appreciate everybody's advice. And uh, again, please keep your questions uh, coming in. I know um, we're, we're addressing some, but we can get to um, as many as we can. We still have some time left. Um, but I did want to say thank you uh, to all our panelists. We'll be hearing from them in a second. Um, but I also wanted to introduce Kendall Hunter from Otis um, to kind of share a little bit about how they're helping to support schools with standards-based learning a little more specifically. So uh, Kendall, if you want to take it away. Yeah, let's do it. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction there and letting me sit in on the conversation. Uh, as Christine introduced, I'm Kendall Hunter. I'm the product marketing manager at Otis. Uh, I joined the team actually straight out of the school setting about five years ago, uh, similar to our panel here. I'm a former educator, middle school special education teacher and reading specialist. Uh, so I'm excited to be here to just tell you a little bit more about Otis. Uh, before I do that, I want to acknowledge the panelists for really just sharing such valuable insights around standards-based grading, especially heading into a new school year. I think that why behind it is really just the North Star for the year ahead. So I appreciate all the insights that have been shared uh, thus far. Uh, but in terms of Otis, I'm just going to share a couple things with you today, show you some of my or tell you about a few of my favorite features. Uh, if you have not heard of Otis, we are a K-12 student data and assessment solution that really helps schools to track and communicate student progress towards learning standards. So there's three features that I'm just going to call out as must-haves for standards-based grading. And I did use standards-based grading with my middle schoolers. So these are the features I actually did use and would use now if I was still in the classroom. Uh, but first, flexibility is key. So uh, in Otis, you can use any learning standards, whether that be your state's Common Core, NGSS, or even homegrown district-created standards. We do see that a lot. All of those can be brought into Otis so that you can measure student learning using the language that you use with your students. Uh, you can link those standards to assessment questions to really determine what students know and don't know. Uh, we offer thousands of pre-created assessments that are already aligned to standards that can sometimes help you to get started. One example of that would be the exemplars math performance test that you heard a little bit from Jay about earlier, uh, but you can definitely build your own as well. Uh, I love a rubric when it comes to standards-based grading, and our rubrics are really the perfect pair for this grading method because you can outline your look-fors and really help students and yourself identify uh, and see where they're at in relation to the standard. So maybe I still need to grow a bit more on this particular standard, but I've mastered this standard. Rubrics are great for that. And especially as we were talking a bit about uh, kind of that rollout, rubrics can be used with any content area or grade level. So it's really a, that common language. Students can submit artifacts to a rubric for you to assess as an educator, like a Google Doc, or if you're an early elementary uh, teacher, I love rubrics for ob observations. Uh, also, for those non-academic skills, I think we like, briefly touched on it at the beginning, but you can use rubrics in Otis to measure skills like citizenship or work completion. Uh, I know Eddie talked a bit about some of those 21st century skills that are incorporated in their portrait of a graduate, especially if you're using standards-based grading. I'm sure you're well-versed on how removing those factors from a grade is so important. And a rubric can measure something as simple as math fact fluency or can go into those student skills and help students see hey, here's where I am academically, but hey, maybe here's where I need to grow as a student in a classroom with my peer collaboration, whatever it would be. Uh, all that data goes directly to a standards-based gradebook in Otis that's organized by learning standard. This is my favorite part of standards-based grading. So I can see the skill, not just I earned an 80% on this test, but what makes up that 80%? What's the 20% that I need to grow on? What are these skills within that? And that's really what uh, these tools can help students to see about where they need to grow. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention is all of this data can help you to generate reports so that you can actually act on it. It's great to see progress, but you need to be able to intervene and do things with the data to really be able to help your students grow. 
Uh, so whether you want to look at one summative assessment or maybe a number of formatives that targeted the same standards, you can do that in Otis in real time and create groups for reteaching. So you can say, hey, this group of kids is going to move past this content. They've mastered it. And maybe this group is going to work with me in small group tomorrow. So it's really giving you the tools that you need to see where kids are at and then support them. Uh, and as we talked about at the end there, that family piece is just so important. Having a streamlined tool to be able to unite around that language, where we go to see that and what that looks like can certainly help uh, with the implementation of things like standards-based grading. Uh, but that was really just a couple of things I like about Otis and I think are worthwhile to the conversation today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, we're at Otis.com. So definitely uh, check out some of our other tools, including standards based grading tools. And I did put some free resources in the content section of your council. So if you're looking for uh, some free downloads to bring back to the team, definitely check those out. But I know we have some questions to answer. I saw some really good engagement and questions coming in. So I'm excited to hear about the panel thing. So I'll hand it off. Uh, to Christine for some Q&A uh, during the remaining time here. Yeah, and Kendall, can you hang on with us so that um, I might address a question or two to you? So thank you sure. for that. And uh, yeah, reminder that the handouts are there and also that this recording will be available. So if you have colleagues you wanna share this with, um, please do, you'll be getting the link um, in your email probably by tomorrow. Uh, one question, and we've got a bunch of questions. This is great. Um, and I'm not sure where to direct this first, but a question came in that can standards-based grading be implemented at a high school? Well, obviously it can be implemented, but um, without impacting the college admission process. I know that's a question I've heard about. And Eddie, I see you're nodding. So may, may I start with you? Sure. Uh, yeah. One of the things, and I'm sorry, Kendall, this is not going to be a commercial for you because uh, in the state of Kentucky, um, Every school in the state of Kentucky uses Infinite Campus as our grade book. Um, so we had to work with Infinite Campus to get our grade book fixed to where we could put the standards in there and the grading scales in there. So uh, uh, here in Shelbyville, in Shelby County, it's a zero to four scale. Um, and then of course that converts. Uh, so like an A would be 3.4 to 4.0 is a is a 4.0 on the on the scale so when you look at a transcript from shelby county schools all you're going to see on there is their class and what their gpa was for that class and then the overall gpa for for their high school career so we've not had any any issues at all with um with colleges and universities except in our kids excellent and I know, uh, Kelly and Barb are a little newer to it. So actually, maybe I'll toss it to you, Kendall, if that's OK, because I'm sure you've heard case study examples um, that address this question. We, would you mind kind of sharing any insight with the question, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we definitely hear this, I would say, in terms of standards based grading implementations. I've seen um, or high schools can be the toughest to get the buy-in because of that concern. But I think once you kind of dial it back to a lot of what we talked about earlier, like those skills and some of the misconceptions around, you know, I'm a 4.0 student, but why am I scoring here? When you really help a student understand their strengths and areas of opportunity, and they can articulate those and know where to focus their efforts, I think that kind of changes the conversation a bit, especially for those middle school students going into high school to know themselves in that capacity is so powerful. So once I, from at least from what, what I've seen, once high school educators have the tools to be able to have those conversations, the fears kind of start to go away because the conversation really moves to what are we doing, you know, with the data? How are we using this to help students be more prepared for their path? Maybe their path isn't college ready. Maybe they want to go right into the workforce or a different career. So when you have the skills to both or the tools to both track, you know, different competencies, whatever those may be, and figure out where to focus your efforts. Students have more control over their learning. And I think ultimately those types of conversations kind of start to shift rather than like, will you get into college? We talk about where we need to grow, where we need to focus, where we need to dial in so that we can get to where we need to go afterwards. Um, but we certainly, you know, have high schools using Otis in that capacity. We have, I'm thinking of one Wisconsin school that's actually not too far away from Barb, who is all in on standards-based grading. And they have said that their students truly know themselves. And that has been the buy-in for the team. When they see a student, like, oh, I am excelling at this. I need to work on this. I'm not great when it comes to my peer collaboration. Or I don't like group projects. Like 
hearing those conversations kind of, I guess, eases some of the fears or concerns. And additionally, seeing students go on from that grading model to college and proving that they can get in and having, you know, a certain uh, graduation rate and all of that uh, is good data validation for parents who are worried if their kids are not going to get into a school. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. <coughs> Another question came in here. Um, do, do, do. So, not, um, yeah, throw us to Kelly. so how can grading practices be adapted to account for diverse student backgrounds and also learning needs, which I think is a huge thing. And uh, I think Kelly, um, may I toss this to you? For, and then anyone else can jump in. Sure, I think, um, you know, I'm not muted. Yeah, I, I think this is, um, it's important that um, and I think that's where the proficiency scales come in so that, you know, parents and students, teachers know where a student falls. Um, our scales show what is um, the grade level standard. That would be what our meets is. And then we have our um, next um, below that would be at what we call a two. But that would have like the prerequisite skills that they need in order to be able to um, meet that. Um, grade level standard. So it really, having those scales really makes things very um, um, evident for students on what they needed, what they need to accomplish and where they're at and where they need to go in order to, to be at grade level. So I think um, it just really helps being um, upfront with kids and really having a plan of, you know, where um, do we want them to go and having a plan of how to get them there. But um, definitely, um, you know, we have kids very many um, grade levels below in our classrooms, just as everyone else does. And it's just a way um, they they know where they need to go. And then that give that skill gives them that pathway to get there. That's great. Thank you. I know, Jay, would you like to chime in from, from the math hat on this question? Sure. So <clears throat> I think one of the powers of standards-based learning is that sort of, you can talk to all students with, with this, I think of learning along a continuum, right? You have absolute novice who really doesn't know anything to an expert and students sort of fall along this spectrum. And if you can sort of celebrate with students their assets, what do they have with them? What can they do successfully? Celebrate that with them and then have an honest conversation of, okay, you know what? Maybe these are two or three steps we're gonna take today to advance, to advance you along this spectrum or this year that, it, and, and one of the other really important pieces I think of, of standards-based learning is having examples of what success looks like. Parents wanna know what that looks like. Students wanna know what that looks like. So if you can put up a, a grade level piece of work and say, okay, third grade class, this is where we're trying to get to. And everybody kind of has a clear image of it. Then you have this ability to sort of say, you're along the spectrum with with communication or with use of representations. And kids can say, yeah, yeah, okay, my, my representation wasn't labeled very well. I can see that. I can see what I'm trying to get to and I can see where mine is. So you can help every student sort of recognize for themselves where they are and where they need to get to. So when you tell what research told us, like Marzano and classroom instruction that works, is that scores are the least effective and powerful way of, of improving student learning. And when you just give it a score, they just think, okay, I'm a 70, that's just what I am. But if we use feedback and focus on that for celebrating where they are and then defining the next couple of steps for them, everybody can sort of lean into those next steps. Like, okay, I'm gonna try working on this. So I think for those students who are struggling or, or below grade level, standards-based learning can be really powerful for them and, and empowering for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it can go in, uh, another way too. Um, it doesn't really address the question, but it it is also having those scales. We also have an exceeds um, section yeah. too. So we have a lot of students in in a classroom that are that meet the standard very early or come in already knowing it. And so we have a clear path on okay, what do we do with those kids to challenge them beyond um, the standard because um, sometimes we kind of forget about those kiddos. So we, we you know, I think um, standards-based grading is a really great um, strategy, great way of making a classroom feel like all kids belong and kind of gives them a roadmap for how to be successful. Kelly, if I can piggyback, I love what you just said. An expert for me in mathematics is a student who can solve the same problem multiple different ways. 
the mm. kid gets the right answer and you're like great you solved it can you solve it another way is a nice way to sort of just push that kid in to stay in the classroom to stay with the rest of the students solve it another way think of another representation um it really challenges them to uh, to think flexibly from a tracking standpoint of that too i would also just add it's so important to communicate where students are at mastery of like which standards they are at mastery of and then which ones they need to grow on so jay i know you gave that math example you know with a clear scale you might say that a student is at a two meaning they've mastered this but haven't mastered this well with standards based grading you can also identify that other standard maybe you're in a fifth grade class but that's a fourth grade standard that they have mastered being able to communicate that as well and not being just locked into hey this week we're working on rl 5.1 this is the only standard that's being measured having the flexibility to say you know these students are working on the fifth grade standards in a fifth grade class but maybe i have a group that's working on a lower level text or they're meeting the fifth grade standard with accommodations the flexibility to both you know extend up or down standards wise and then give comments on um you know on the grade level standard why a student isn't there in addition to having that clear grading scale that uh, Kelly talked a bit about having that extra context, like they're meeting at fourth grade, but they're, you know, below grade level on the fifth grade standard. So I think that really gives families a good understanding too. like, here's where we are seeing, seeing success, but here, here's the parts where we need to grow. So we're going to keep building on this standard so that they can get to the next standard. And it's really just a communication piece. But if you have the right tools that allow you to kind of flexibly work with your standards is less um, daunting, I think. I know when I was a teacher, everyone was like, how can we track four different grade levels of standards in one role, I'm one teacher, but it's like that becomes more, less of a concern and more of just like a data entry thing if you have the right tools that allow you to kind of level up and level down for your students. Thank you, and uh, I don't know if, uh, let's see if Barb or Eddie wants to chime in on this. We have so many questions, we're out of time. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, Barb or, or uh, Eddie, you want to chime in with this question about just using uh, standard space for kind of helping all students? I just think when I was in the classroom, I was um, early elementary, so first grade, second grade, and just how, I mean, they're goal driven already, and they like to see that they've succeeded in something. So, I mean, this kind of just naturally falls in line with the way that they are. I think as they've gotten older, it's, you know, it's changed a little bit, but um, something as basic as, you know, their, their sight words or something, it's right there in front of them. It's laid out. They know what they've, you know, excelled at, where they need to work, um, and then you help them get there. So I feel like, you know, starting at the young age is pretty, pretty easy for, you know, for them. And then to continue to grow, it's the way that they've been thinking the whole time. Excellent. Eddie, did you want to add anything? I think I think they've said it well. Okay, <laughs> great. So uh, we are out of time, friends. I And I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. I know that um, our friends at Otis do have access to those questions and they can address um, any specific questions you might have. Um, and again, this recording will be made available within a day or two. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for this panel discussion. It was incredible. Thank you to Otis for making this conversation possible. And thank you to all of you uh, for spending your time with us today and for sharing your questions and your feedback. We really appreciate that. Uh, and now it's time to announce the winner of our $250 Amazon card. So drum roll, please. Our winner is Amber Sherrick from Ohio. So congratulations, Amber. And thanks to you all for joining us once again. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Tech and Learning webinar. Have a great day.